Daniel chapter 3 is where we find ourselves as we move verse by verse through that book. Daniel chapter 3. It's the time of year when hurricanes are in the news all the time. In some cases, there seems to be a long buildup before the storm hits. Last month when Florence was on the way, it seemed like there was a lot of lead-in to it. Enough time for 1.7 million people to evacuate their homes, or at least be ordered to evacuate their homes in their Carolinas and Virginia. But then this week, it seemed like Hurricane Michael just came out of nowhere, right? Uh, in fact, today, the USA, or USA Today posted a story titled, Too Late to Run, Hurricane Michael Set to Crash into Florida as Historic Category 4 Storm. Florida Governor Rick Scott said this at a press conference today, the time to evacuate coastal areas has come and gone. If you are in an inland county, you might have one more chance to evacuate, but only if local officials say it is safe. Now, the storms of life tend to be just as erratic as the hurricanes we follow on the news. Some are a sort of slow build you can kind of see forming on the horizon. Others hit with a lot less warning. In all those situations, particularly when they involve an attack on our spiritual lives, what can we do to walk victoriously without compromising our love for the Lord? Well, Daniel and his three friends give us just a treasure trove of examples, some of the best examples in all the Bible packed into the first half of the book of Daniel. And chapter 3 has one of the most famous of these examples, the fiery furnace incident. Our verses this evening are pretty straightforward. They're even a little bit repetitive. I say that with love and respect for God's word. You'll see. Uh, Even still, they're full of a lot of important content. And I'd like us to take a look at what we're seeing here from three slightly different angles. First, to consider what it would have been like to be one of the godly Hebrews in this story. Second, to compare King Nebuchadnezzar with our own king, Jesus Christ. And then third, to address a controversy or two that comes out of this text. And so let's take a few minutes here at the beginning and consider what it would have been like to live out these verses as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. Now, when we last left off, they had been promoted to oversee all the affairs in the province of Babylon. The empire of Babylon, broken up into a number of different provinces, stretched far and wide across the known world. Daniel uh, ha- was in perhaps one of the very highest offices in the government. Uh, we might see him as a sort of Secretary of State, but it seemed like he had even more uh, power and influence than that. Uh, but his three friends weren't much further down the ladder. He had lobbied King Nebuchadnezzar and said, Hey, can you get these guys promoted? And he did. He set them over uh, the province of Babylon itself. They held key positions of power in this empire. Now, we're not sure how long it's been between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Based on what we're told in verse 12 of our text, we know that it does have to be after chapter 2. Some scholars feel it would have been a year or two after. Some feel it could have been as many as 20 years after chapter 2 closes. We simply don't know. It comes after. It says there in verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and it's with six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Archaeologists have found a brick foundation upon which this statue may well have been set up. The dimensions of the uh, base match and the proximity to the city line up with what is recorded here. While we're short on some specific details, here's what we do know. This thing was really large for a monument or for a statue. It was as tall as an eight-story building. Uh, significantly taller than the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the ancient wonders of the world. It's taller than anything we have in Hanford. Quite a display. I don't even know where the closest eight-story building is. Uh, but this is quite a display, uh, an imposing statue. Now, if we were reading Daniel's book like you read a normal book, without taking week-long breaks in between each chapter, this would, of course, feel very connected to the previous story, where Nebuchadnezzar had had his dream of a glorious statue that was set up. Daniel had told him, okay, that statue that you saw in your dream, that image symbolizes the flow of human history. Each segment represents a different world empire. Babylon, that's simply the first portion, the portion of gold, and then below that, uh, these other kingdoms, these other portions. But then what do we see? 
Well, we see Nebuchadnezzar sort of lives out his dream. Go, pursue your dreams, Nebuchadnezzar. He sets up this image, but he doesn't recreate what he saw in the dream. No, rather, in a bold affront to God, he makes the entire image of gold, signaling that he has rejected God's truth, that his rule and his empire would eventually end. His act here is a blasphemous challenge to Daniel's God. Oh, you think you're in charge, God of the Hebrews? Aren't you the God that I destroyed when I took over Jerusalem and took all of your treasure out of your temple? Uh, I'll show you who the everlasting king is. Ain't nobody going to turn my chest and belly into silver and bronze. And he makes this whole thing out of gold, or at least makes it out of wood and overlays the whole thing with gold. Now, Put yourself, if you can, in the place of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're living life, right? You've done pretty well for yourself having been a captive, a prisoner of war, right? You've made it through this training program. You all of a sudden are vaulted into this great position of leadership. You're doing a great job. You're applying yourself, all that sort of thing. You're living life, doing your job, honoring your God, and evil comes knocking. It crops up right in your own backyard. And it's profound evil. It's blasphemy. Uh, Now, I'm guessing this was no surprise to them. After all, this is a pretty significant building project. I mean, they didn't wake up one day and look out and say, well, what's that out there? I mean, this is a big deal that requires a lot of planning. Nebuchadnezzar, one of the things we know about him from history is that he was a builder, a meticulous architect, and he knew what he was doing. And to build something that's, you know, 90 feet tall and 10 feet wide or so, I mean, this is a, an undertaking. These people were no dummies. And so uh, they would have, this would have come as no surprise to them. The dedication service that we're going to read about for this idol would have, was huge. There's a ton of people there coming from all over the empire, coming from other nations, coming from all the provinces of Babylon. It would have had a lot of moving parts. It would have taken a lot of time to plan, to send out, to schedule. We're going to see this big orchestra. They had to have all this music and it was all coordinated. There was a lot of things going on. And after all, our three heroes were over the affairs of that province. And so it was more than likely that they knew what was coming. In fact, they probably had to be involved in the logistics of planning this dedication service. We don't know exactly, but it certainly wasn't a surprise to them what was coming uh, down the pike. That's how storms can happen for us sometimes, right? We see something in our culture or something in our nation sort of brewing, and we see, man, yeah, that, that's going to come to a head at some point. That's going to come and show up at some point, and it's going to be a problem for our Christianity. For example, sometimes attacks on our faith or uh, on the truth of the Bible or on Christianity will sometimes come in the form of a new law or a ballot proposition, Right? Now, in those situations, because we live in the greatest country in the world, we often have the opportunity to cast a vote, right? To voice our opposition, to say, no, we disagree. And if enough of us get together and say, no, we disagree, well, that can make a big difference. We have the chance to say, no, we would like that not to happen. And we should make it a point to engage biblically in that process when we can But, you know, that wasn't the case in Babylon. You didn't get a vote. It didn't matter how high you were up in the government. No vote, no protest. Uh, This storm that had been brewing finally made landfall one day. Look at verse 2. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. This was a huge event. Everybody's there. Uh, Military officials, administrative officials, religious officials, bureaucrats, financial guys, intellectuals from far and wide uh, were all brought there to be a part of this service. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar unified the Neo-Babylonian Empire. A lot of the scholars think he maybe was even sort of unifying the religion here and saying, hey, here's how we're going to do religion from here on now. I mean, so this is a big, big undertaking. They needed everybody there uh, because he had a real vision for what he wanted. 
It would have taken a decent amount of time to organize, like I said. And here's what's most remarkable to me, is that these three guys, our three heroes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did not find a way to escape the dedication, but they met it head on. They attended that day. Now, it kind of seems like, well, yeah, they had to. But think about it. These are men of means, by this time. Yes, they were prisoner of war, but think about it. They're like in charge of the most important province in the entire empire. They're men of means. They're men of power. They're men who command others. You're telling me they couldn't get their hands on a chariot if they really wanted to? You're telling me they, they couldn't have squirreled away, you know, a little slush fund here and there to escape out of Babylon? It wouldn't have been right, but they could have done that. These were the kind of men that could have done the kinds of things we see the other officials in Babylon doing all the time. They're always conniving and planning and scamming and working all of these things out. And these three guys have more access, more power, more ability, more means to do that than maybe almost anybody else there that day. They could have found a way to hide. Hey, even if you just showed up right at the beginning and then slipped away, right? You ever done that at a party? (laughs) I'm not really a social event kind of guy. And like you, so a lot of times you think, you know, if I show my face, as long as like three people see me, we can dip out of here. And then everybody thinks I came, right? No, nobody else. I know there's some other introverts out there, but so, you know, they didn't hide. They didn't escape. They didn't do any of that. Why not? Aren't there times when God's people are allowed to run from danger? Well, of course they are. The life of the Apostle Paul shows us that that's okay, at least sometimes. Once when uh, Paul was, his life was threatened, what happened? He was lowered down the walls of Jerusalem in a basket so he could, could escape. He just ran in the night, right, to get to the next place so that he wouldn't be killed. Another time, he heard of a conspiracy to kill him, and so he then reported it to the Romans, and they gave him a huge protection detail to get him where he needed to go, Right? And then, of course, at other times in Paul's life, he willingly, willfully endured brutal attacks, brutal assaults for the sake of the gospel, refusing to escape, even in some circumstances when his friends and brothers in the Lord were begging him, hey, man, you got to get out of here. And he said, hey, I'm going to stay. Now, what we find in the example of Scripture is that sometimes God has his people run and sometimes he has them brace for impact in these situations. What all these biblical examples reveal is that there is no one-size-fits-all answer to a situation like this or to when a storm comes or when an attack comes on your faith or in your life. What does that mean then? Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, it means we need to be spirit-led people. We need to allow the Lord to actually direct the things that we're doing and the choices that we make. Daniel's three friends were. I mean, it's clear from these stories that Daniel and his friends were spirit-led. Don't you, when you read these stories, you're like, you seem like you know things that we don't know as readers. They have just this calmness and this, and this confidence and this ability to keep themselves collected. And is it because they had some magic bat phone that they could call heaven for? No, it wasn't at all. But they were being what we would call spirit led. As they saw this dedication service taking shape, they realized that for whatever reason, God wanted them to attend rather than escape knowing full well what that would probably mean. If you work for Nebuchadnezzar, whether it's for one year or 20 years, you know what he's about. I can't even fathom how many people he just had killed in front of him. You know what I mean? Because every time we see him, he's like wiping out whole so I kill all those people. See those people over there, wipe them out. When he's not conquering whole nations, he's there saying, all right, everybody in the whole category of wise men, just kill all those people. Yeah, kill their families too. That's the kind of guy he was. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that. And so they knew what it would mean that they were going to go to this service and that there was going to be a moment that they were going to have to make a stand for the Lord. Now, we know why they needed to go to the service, right? We know the rest of the story. But these three guys, they didn't know what was going to happen. And we'll see that in subsequent weeks. They didn't know how this was going to work out. The Lord hadn't appeared to them and said, okay, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to bow down, and the Nebuchadnezzar is going to throw you in a fiery furnace, but you're going to be okay. They're going to say outright, well, we don't really know if we're going to die or not, but whatever, man. And so they don't know what's going to happen, but they know that the Lord wanted them to go to this service. Now, in this instance, God had a great plan and wanted them in place that day, not on the run. 
What was supposed to be the dedication of a blasphemous idol would instead become a demonstration of their dedication to Jehovah, no turning back. And it would become one of the most inspiring and enduring stories of the whole Old Testament. The story is a big deal, and it's been a big deal for thousands of years. That's why the Lord wanted them to attend the service that day. So who knows what your day might hold, right? This is why we have to be spirit-led. And think, yeah, there's not just a formula for figuring out, here's what I do in every single situation. You know, the Apostle Paul did one thing in one situation, and then in the same, very similar situation, he, he did something else. And it's not because he was just like a politician wavering back and forth, it's because he was spirit-led. Right? Sometimes it's like, hey, you beat me. By the way, I forgot to mention while you were about to beat me that I'm a Roman citizen. Other times they're like, okay, we're going to beat you. He says, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. And so we see that there isn't just some formula you follow like we're some sort of mechanical Christian robot, but that we have this living relationship with God who has all sorts of intentions that we can't fathom and that we can't foresee, right? And God is looking down into these three guys' life and he's saying, I really need three men there that day. Because we're going to write a story the whole world is going to learn about for thousands of years. And so the encouragement to us is who knows what your day might hold tomorrow. Our day's pretty much over. The Lord could still do a whole bunch of stuff through any one of our lives this evening. But think about tomorrow. I don't know what your day's going to hold tomorrow. And I don't know if there's going to be a storm hitting land in your life tomorrow. Maybe, maybe not. If it does, I don't know if you should flee or stay. But the Lord knows, and the Lord has intentions, and the Lord wants to reveal these things to you. And so we have to be spirit-led, have a real, actual, dynamic relationship with God where we say, okay, Lord, I'm going to allow you to govern my life. I'm not going to approach my relationship with you as if it's an algebra equation, foil, first, outer, inner, last, and it's always in that order all the time. That's how we do it. That's not what we see uh, in the Bible demonstrated. We have no way of seeing the future the way God can, and so we must be spirit-led in our choices and in our conduct. Verse 4 says this, Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the, the horn, or the hort, the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down to worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So, at that time, when all the per- people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, and the lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Very clear choice was set before them, life or death. There our heroes were in the moment faced with the choice, who will you serve? Joshua had sort of said that, not metaphorically, but it wasn't so severe. Remember, Joshua said, hey, choose who this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Joshua didn't mean we choose today and I'm going to kill everybody who chooses the other people, right? But for these guys, in that moment, it was a choose this day whom you're going to serve. And it had uh, really severe uh, ramifications. The Lord or the world. From the time of the proclamation and the start of the symphony, they would have only moments to make their choice, right? What do you do in a scene like this? If this happened to you, what do you do? Or as is much more common for us when we have to make a choice whether to compromise or not in some less severe way. Very few of us have to actually face a life and death choice in our regular lives in regard to our Christianity, right? There are lots of Christians in other parts of the world that are facing these life and death choices. Christians in the Middle East, Christians in the Far East, where being a Christian actually means you might die today. We don't really have to face that at this point. That would be quite an anomaly for us here in the United States. But we're all still inundated with choices of, okay, well, are you going to go God's way or are you going to compromise and give in to sin or give in to the world's way in some less severe, less final way? All of us have to make choices regarding godliness, integrity, serving God or serving the world, spiritual faithfulness or compromise. Now, for this particular 
situation where it was talking about like, hey, you're about to be martyred for your faith. Well, the scripture gives us a great promise. Scriptures declare that if we're brought into a situation like that, that's this severe, the Holy Spirit is going to fill us with all the power and the actual words that we need to speak. That's a great promise from the Lord, uh, and we want to hold on to that promise. But for our less uh, life and death lives that we live as Christians here in the West, there's a practical principle we can keep in mind from this example. Notice how it's worded there. The herald said, to you it is commanded. That seems so final. It seems like there's no other option. What are you going to do? I'm being commanded. Yet, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Christian is operating under a whole set of directives that supersede any command like this one. I was thinking about all those cars on the road whose license plate says California exempt, right? What does that mean? They're exempt. So the command comes out to you and I, everybody, if you're driving on the roads of California, you have to, you're commanded to register your car. If you don't register your car, you're going to get pulled over, your car's going to be taken away, you're going to lose your job, all that kind of stuff, right? You must register your car. Unless, of course, your license plate says California exempt, there's no, t- and then that's it. They're exempt from that law. Now, for a godly person who belongs to the Lord, I mean, the situation in Babylon is serious, to be sure, but it's not an unsolvable problem because they're exempt from this. They already know what the answer is. The decision's already made, so of course we can't obey this command. This doesn't even apply to us. You might as well not even tell us because we're not going to obey you, bowing down to this false idol. Promote it how you want, incentivize us how you want, threaten us how you want. The choice is already decided. I'm going to serve the Lord. I know I can't bow before this idol because I'm operating under a whole different set of directives. And when your commands conflict with the directives I've been given from the Word of God, yeah, there's not even a contest. I don't actually have to think about it. Verse 8 says this, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. I suppose these Chaldeans had stopped caring about the fact that these three Hebrews were instrumental in saving their lives back in chapter 2. Without these three guys and Daniel who had their special prayer meeting and said, hey, we can solve this problem, all these guys would be dead. But yeah, we forgot about that. Uh, We should expect that. You know, when you're talking about people who don't belong to the Lord, people who are lost, held captive by sin, we can't expect grace and agape from those people, right? Did, w- before you were a Christian, were you pouring mercy and grace and compassion and kindness and goodness out of your life? No, none of us were. Now, Daniel uses particularly strong language in verse 8 when it says that they accused the Jews. It's a vivid term. It means something like they devoured or tore them limb from them. They ate them apart. It's, it's really kind of grotesque imagery. What they're doing here is vicious and hate-filled. These guys symbolize for us our accuser, the devil, who we're told accuses the brethren, you and I, day and night. And what does he do? He seeks to devour, seeks to destroy. But you know what? We need not fear because just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have the Lord stand with them in their trial, so we have our advocate, Jesus Christ, so much greater than the accuser. We don't need to worry about the accuser even a little bit because our advocate has already won. And the Chaldeans here show their hand. They're jealous of the position that these three Jews were in. And there in verse 12, they make their accusation. Now, part of what they say is true and part of what they say is not true. It was true that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not worship the image and did not serve the gods of Babylon. Yeah, that's true. And you know what? Everybody knew that. All the time, uh, these guys and Daniel were first and foremost servants of the Most High God. In fact, when uh, Darius comes to pull Daniel out of the lion's den, he's going to say, Daniel, servant of the Most High God. That's how he thought of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, even later in this passage, is going to say of these guys, hey, servants of the Most High God. And so everybody knew that that's who these guys were. 
Yeah, we don't serve these Babylonian gods, your weirdo fish gods who do. And I was like reading, man, I fell down the rabbit hole and was reading some of the weird mythologies of Marduk and like the weird stuff that the Babylonian gods were said to have done in their mythology. And everybody knew. Everybody they worked with, everybody they were around, they knew, yeah, those guys, they're servants of the Most High God. They're servants of Jehovah. And they were open about it. It was obvious. May it be said of us that we do not worship the gods of this world, but that we are servants of the Most High God. That when people think of us, they think, yeah, you know what, that guy, that guy serves the Lord. I don't even know what that means, but he does it. Now, they also said something that was not true. They said, they have not paid due regard to you, Nebuchadnezzar. And that simply wasn't true. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three of the best employees the empire had. They were men of honor and integrity. They had found favor in the palace. They were ten times better than all of the other wise men, remember? They are an effective example of what it means to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to render to God what is God's. What was due Nebuchadnezzar, they had given. And they will continue to give as the story unfolds. Worship was not due Nebuchadnezzar. He did not get worship. It did not belong to him. It was not due him. And you know, as Christians, we need to be careful to make sure that we give to God what belongs to God and we give it to Him alone. He says, I'm the Lord your God. I'm the King of your life. And we have to be careful and say, okay, that's due to God. And if there's anything in life or anything in the world around us who says we want a piece of that, We have to say, no, it's not due to the world. It's not due to our culture. It's not due to any of these other things. You know, it's easy for us to betray the Lord's rule in our lives through compromise or fear or convenience. And so we just want to be careful, like these three guys were, that we give to the Lord all his due and we do not give any of it away. And if the world comes along and says, hey, just pay your dues, keep your head down, you'll compromise a little, but it'll be okay in the end. No, I don't owe those dues to you. My worship and my devotion and my life belongs to the Lord. It does not belong to some earthly king or some earthly kingdom. We'll leave the text suspended for now. Let's take a moment to compare our two kings here as we start to wrap this up. This is a theme that keeps cropping up in the book. We're all called to choose who we're going to serve. We will serve somebody. We're either going to serve the kingdom of Jesus Christ or the kingdom of the world. How we make that choice? Well, take a look at how the world's king works. You have a man who cares nothing for his closest advisors, his best and brightest servants, the people who actually run his empire for him. He cares only for himself. He'd kill all of those people just as soon as look at them. He doesn't care even a little bit. He doesn't care that it would impoverish his own nation to wipe them all out. Notice here he set up the image and the furnace at the same time. Do you notice that? This great golden image. Look at what a great golden king I am. Also the furnace that I'm going to burn a bunch of you in. He set them up at the same time. As the herald made the proclamation, it's clear that the fiery furnace was good to go. And you can kind of even sense that Nebuchadnezzar is like, yeah, somebody, somebody. Somebody test me so I can burn you alive in front of people. We saw in the previous passage, he was going to round up all the wise men and have them pulled apart publicly. That's the kind of king this dude is. You know, our Lord extends grace and mercy and love, the absolute opposite of Nebuchadnezzar's way of doing things. He laid down his own life so that his enemies could be saved. From the cross, he said, hey, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the kind of king Jesus Christ is. Now, perhaps you're thinking, ah, but what about hell? Isn't that the same thing? Isn't that just an eternal fiery furnace? Well, you know, the difference is Nebuchadnezzar made the furnace to intimidate and strike fear and to take pleasure in destroying those who dared cross him. God says that hell was not made for man, it was made for the devil and his angels, and that he's not willing that any humans go there. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, so that he can then save them and adopt them as sons and daughters and give them an everlasting inheritance in the perfection of heaven. That's a lot different than what Nebuchadnezzar's doing here. Here we see Nebuchadnezzar also would rather surround himself with despicable, backstabbing, murderous yes-men like these Chaldeans then give these excellent Hebrews the freedom to worship their God. Now Christ, we're told, makes us free. Christ makes us free so that we might reciprocate the love that he has shown to us. He wants to be in a real relationship with us. 
Compare that to what Nebuchadnezzar is asking of his people. This life on earth, it's like living in Babylon. We have pressures, storms, choices, whether we'll compromise or not. Consider the kings and choose who you really want to serve. And then finally, we should address two small controversies in the text. Believe it or not, the first one has to do with the orchestra. Who knew? Uh, If you read commentaries, even from some really solid guys who we heartily recommend, you may encounter one or two of them who try to take this text to suggest that utilizing instruments in worship is an ungodly thing in the Christian church. They say, here you go. And there's like big, long paragraphs about it. Using instruments, look, it's worldly and it's carnal. It appeals to the base pagan heart of man. Look how the people of Babylon responded. Babylon did it here to encourage blasphemous worship. Therefore, using instruments to praise God in heaven is an evil thing. Okay, well, there's a lot we could say on that issue. But I'll just stick to one thing from our text. Let's stick here. If we're to extract from these verses that instruments in worship is bad because it's what Babylon did, we must also come to the conclusion that acting as heralds who proclaim the message of our king, warning of the judgment to come, is also bad, right? Didn't Babylon do that too? Well, they had instruments in worship. Yeah, they also had a guy, a herald, uh, taking the king's message to every people, nation, and language, proclaiming the life and death choice that all men must bow or face the wrath of the king. Isn't that evangelism? Isn't that preaching? And so if you're going to say, look at what Babylon did, if you do what Babylon did, that's evil. And what they mean is if you use instruments like we did here tonight to sing songs to the Lord, that's evil and carnal. Okay, well then acting like the herald is also evil and carnal. Going out and proclaiming the word of the king, the message of our sovereign, that must be evil too. You can't just pick one as evil and say, well, the other one's good. When we do it, it's good. But when you do that, it's bad. You can't build a doctrine of worship from a text like this. And so just a word to you, if you're reading commentaries, you may come across that argument. And then the second question, the important one, where was Daniel? He's nowhere to be found in this entire story, right? So there are three options. Where's Daniel? Option one, he bowed down to the image. That's simply unbelievable. Uh, This was a man who was ready to die at like the age of 16 over food, over eating a hamburger rather than (laughs) kosher food. Uh, and, And that was a pattern of his life that at any moment we see it, whether he's young or whether he's old, he's ready to die for his faith in God. That's not just a once in a lifetime. He had a fit of religious fervor and like, I'll die for my diet. This is who Daniel was. He was ready to die all the time, and so he didn't bow. Option two is he didn't bow, but the Chaldeans were too afraid of him to lump him in with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That They saw him, and they're like, well, but he's too powerful. We'll focus on these three guys. This seems too fantastic to believe as well, since Daniel is not found interceding for his brothers in any way through the whole uh, course of the story. He put his life on the, live, on the line earlier to save pagan wise men. He said, hey, don't kill the wise men. He didn't go into Nebuchadnezzar and say, hey, don't kill me and my friends. Kill those other dudes. I'll interpret the dream for you. He went in and put his life on the line to save those guys. And now we're to think that he stood idly by while his cl- closest friends were thrown into a fiery furnace? That can't be either. Option three is that Daniel, as Secretary of State, was away on some business that kept him from being in attendance at the dedication ceremony, that he was somewhere acting on behalf of the king. This not only makes the most sense, but actually gives us a wonderful type, a picture of the end times. Remember, this is a prophetic book. We learn a lot about God's plan for Israel and the end times. And so in these passages, Nebuchadnezzar, the wicked world leader, becomes a picture for us, a type of the Antichrist. The image he set up is a type of the abomination of desolation, which Daniel is going to talk about in chapter 12. The three Jewish believers become a type of the nation of Israel enduring the fiery trials of the great tribulation. And so Daniel being mysteriously absent then becomes a type for us of the church. Just gone. Where's that guy? He gone. Gone from the scene. The church will be raptured before the events of the Great Tribulation, just as Daniel is not found suffering with the others, but is altogether absent from the story. It's a great hidden picture in this famous story. 
And so as we await the moment when we are caught up to be with the Lord, we remember that we walk in power. We have no need to fear whether a storm comes out of nowhere or builds on the horizon. We know who we believe. We serve our King and He loves us. He is with us and He will see us through whatever we might face in life. Amen? Amen. 